Hello, this is Jared Niemi with a mini lecture on multiple comparisons in the context of a one way ANOVA uh, in terms of pairwise comparisons amongst group means and how to perform the multiple comparison procedures in SAS. All right, so last time when we were talking about the one way ANOVA F test, we had this slide. Right, this slide was basically showing the ANOVA table and we had a p-value that was small. That p-value being small meant it, that we would say we reject the null hypothesis that all the group means are equal. And so my question now is, what have we really learned? Right, and at this point we really haven't learned very much. And the reason we haven't learned very much is all we know is that there are some group means that are different but we don't know which ones are bigger or smaller than others. And so we're going to go a little bit farther in this lecture and, and do tests uh, of pairwise comparisons between means so that we can at least say which means in the group are different, not just that there's at least one. All right, in fact, that's what this line right here is going to do for us. This happens to be the way that we do comparisons amongst all the means, and we're going to talk about it in a bit, but this adjust option right here is saying to use T for Tukey, and we'll see why we want to use that in a couple slides. Um, all right, so here's uh, the first example. This is actually is an example of what you would get if you did not put that adjust procedure if you use the LSD, which um, more or less does no adjustment. It looks at a significant F test, which we had, and then after that, does no adjustment to the p-values. So at least well, a couple things we've seen here now is that we actually have been provided the estimates of the means, right? So we can at least say that these estimated means that the NR40 group is the largest, followed by RR50, then NR50, um, then low pro, then N85, and then NP. And so, although we can say that the estimates themselves are in that order, and that there are differences in the estimates, the question now is there differences in the population means for these different diets. All right, and so this table down below does pairwise comparisons for each, each pair of diets and says, are they significantly different from each other? Right, so this right here says, is diet one significantly different from diet two? We go up here and we know that over here it's telling us which ones are one and two. So that comparison is between N N85 and NR40. And so right here, this p-value being really small, would say that we would reject an all hypothesis that those two means are equal. The p-value being small actually tells us that the probability of observing a test statistic, in this case a t-statistic, as or more extreme than what we observed, if the means are the same, is really small. All right, so if we go around this table and use our nominal level of significance of 0.05, right, what does the 0.05 mean? The 0.05 actually means that we're willing to be wrong 5% of the time. All right, so we want to only be wrong 5% of the time, and we're going to look over this table, and we're going to reject any, a null hypothesis for any p-value that's less than 0.05. I should point out at this point that this table is symmetric around the blank line in the middle, so we really only need to look at either the top half of the table or the bottom half. And what can we can see here? We can see that group 1 is different from 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So it's different from all the other groups at our nominal 0.05 level. Group 2 is different from uh, diet, so diet 2 is different from diet 3, 4, and 6, but not from 5, right? At least there's no, there's not enough evidence in the data to say there is a difference between these two. Diet 3 is different from 4 and 6, diet 4 is different from 5 and 6, and diet 5 is different from diet 6. All right, so basically we had uh, every difference being significant except for these two, right? 2, 3, and five. So let's just say those are the three that were the highest in the group. Right? So we don't have evidence using this nominal cutoff that there's any difference between those uh, three, uh, but there are differences amongst the rest of the, the diets. So this note down here is warning us that something might be going wrong in our calculation. In particular, this was the pairwise comparisons. So it's pairwise because we're looking at every pair of diets. This is the pairwise comparisons uh, between uh, all the diets. And, and this note is trying to tell us there's something uh, amiss here. So what's amiss? Here's what's amiss. 
the first thing is that when we're looking at six different diets and we're looking at all pairwise comparisons, the one thing we should can be concerned about is how many comparisons we're actually doing. And so the question is here, how many ways are there to choose two items out of six? And we just use our binomial uh, calculation here, six choose two to find that out. We can do the calculation to find out that there are 15 different ways, uh, different pair combinations that we can see. And so that corresponds exactly to the 15 p-values we actually looked at on the previous slide in the table. So then the question is, all right, if we're using our 0.05 level of significance, remember we only want to be wrong 5% of the time, the question then becomes, across all of the p-values we looked at, what is the probability of falsely rejecting at least one true null hypothesis? So that's saying, if, let's say if all the null hypotheses were true and we use this 0.05 cutoff, what's the probability that when we reject that we're wrongly rejecting at least one true null hypothesis? Right, so, so the probability of falsely rejecting at least one true null hypothesis is 1 minus the probability of not rejecting any. So that's 1 minus, 1 minus the alpha level, so this is 0.95 raised to the 15th. We can do that calculation and find that the probability of falsely rejecting at least one true null hypothesis, if they're all true, if all the null hypotheses are true, is 54%. So there's greater than a 50% probability that we falsely reject a true null hypothesis. All right, this seems counterintuitive because wasn't the point we used our level of cut, our significance of 0.05, and so we wanted our probability of making a mistake to be 0.05? And so this is an issue called the multiple comparisons issue. And what we basically need to do is adjust our p-values for the fact that we are doing these multiple comparisons in order to maintain that, that our overall error rate is 5%. Right? What we did is we made sure that each individual test was 5% error. But if we want to control our overall error rate at 5%, then we need to do something different. And so what we're going to do is called a multiple comparison adjustment. All right, and on this slide, I'm just going to couch this in terms of creating a confidence interval for the difference. Um, there's an equivalent expression for the mean, but I think this is an easy way to see what the differences are. All right, so the, the standard way of comparing doing uh, two sample comparisons is through this formula right here. Right, we have the mean for one group minus the mean of the other group plus or minus some critical value, I'm going to call it m for now, times the pooled standard deviation times the square root of the inverse of the sum of the sample sizes in those two groups. And now if we only have a two sample t-test, this pooled standard deviation comes from those two samples. But if we're doing an ANOVA, um, or we're assuming normality across all groups with a common variance for all those groups, then this pooled standard deviation is going to come from all the groups. All right, so then the question is, well, what do we plug in for this critical value m? All right, so here's going to be a, a few different options for multiple comparison adjustment procedures that you could do. The appropriate one in here is the Tukey Kramer adjustment. And I'm putting this m column here just to show you what this test statistic is, but um, it doesn't matter to me for the purpose of this course for you to know exactly uh, what that is. Right? It's more important for me that you know when it's appropriate to use which procedure. So when you're doing all pairwise comparisons as we are in this problem, then the two key Kramer adjustment is the appropriate adjustment to make. There's uh, something called the Chaffe adjustment. This is uh, what you want to use if you're looking at all possible contrasts or if you're at least looking at a large number of different contrasts, then this is the right procedure to use. We'll be talking about contrast in a later lecture. Oops. Um, the Dunnett procedure is a procedure to use if you're comparing all groups to a control. The LSD procedure, which is the, the default here, just does exactly the, um, the, the two sample t-test adjustment, but now using the fact that we have more than uh, two groups. And, and it is basically doing no adjustment, but it's saying you should only look at pairwise comparisons if you have a significant f-test. 
Right? If your F test says that there's no difference, that there's no evidence of a difference between any of the groups, then you don't do don't look at the pairwise comparisons at all. But otherwise, this does absolutely no adjustment. All right, the the other one <coughs> that would be of interest is the Bonferroni procedure. So this Bonferroni procedure is of interest because it works in more general scenarios than these other procedures work. So basically, any time you're doing K tests, you can use the Bonferroni procedure. And in order to do the Bonferroni procedure, what you basically do is divide your alpha level by the number of tests that you're doing. Right? In this case, we're doing um, well. We're doing 15 tests. Right? We had 15 comparisons. Okay, so that's the uh, multiple. That's so. In order to control the overall error rate, you want to do these one of these multiple comparison adjustments and do the appropriate one for the use that you're actually using. So in this case, we're going to look at two of them. We're going to look at the Bonferroni and the Tukey Kramer. First, we're going to look at Bonferroni. All right. So here, up on top, it tells you that there's an adjustment for multiple comparisons and that you're using Bonferroni. It also does not have the note here anymore because it realizes that you're doing something, that you're at least aware that there's an adjustment procedure that should be done. Nothing has changed from the table up here, but now if we look down here, we do see some changes amongst the p-values. So now we see the ones that are not significant. So now we can still use this table at the 0.05 level because these p-values have been adjusted up due to the Bonferroni procedure. So at the 0.05 level, now there's no difference between 2 and 3, 2 and 5, 3 and 5, 3 and 6, and 5 and 6. All right, so there's no difference between those groups, which is more groups that were not significant than existed when we did no adjustment. So that's the Bonferroni procedure, but I mentioned that in this particular scenario where you're looking at all pairwise comparisons, the appropriate procedure is the Tukey Kramer. So I'm going to move forward one slide. Here's the Tukey Kramer procedure, and then I'm going to go back and forth a little bit and maybe look at this p-value right here. So I'm going back to Bonferroni, and notice it went up. Now I'm going to go to this one right here, the 2 versus 5, and I'm going to go back to the Bonferroni, and notice it went up. Same thing happens with all the p-values. So the Bonferroni is going to be more conservative. There's going to be less of a chance that you actually reject a hypothesis using Bonferroni. So this is one reason that if you're doing all pairwise comparisons, you want to be using Tukey Kramer because it's going to allow you to uh, reject more tests but still have an overall uh, error rate that you want. All right, so. So here we have uh, no significant difference here, 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 and there at our 0.05 level. All right, so uh, still at this point, uh, I want to point out that we haven't really learned a whole lot. Right? What have we really learned? We've learned that if the null hypothesis is true, that is, for the following pair, right, for uh, all the pairs of data, that the means are actually equal then the, these data that we see are highly unlikely. Right? So these pairs seem highly unlikely. So these are the pairs that we think there's some significant difference. But again, we don't really have a good uh, idea about how big is this difference. Right? Or trying to answer questions like, if you wanted the longest lifetime, which diet should you prefer? And finally, does it really make a difference? This is getting at practical versus significant versus statistical significance. All right, so um, in the future slides, we're going to be talking more about constructing confidence intervals uh, for these pairwise differences and looking at contrast, which get at more specific questions about what's going on. Thank you.